Hi everyone, it's Nathaniel again. So as I was uh, finishing up my week of reading, I realized that all the books, or the three books that I had read this past week, all had a similar trope to them. They were all one-on-one -on -one primarily in their uh, narration. They were very, very extremely different books, but it was still, um, I thought it was an interesting pattern and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, the, the first book that I finished reading was Fish Swimming in Dappled Sunlight. This is a book by Riku Onda. Uh, it is essentially, it's about a brother and sister who were separated when they were young and they have come together for their last night uh, living in this one house before they go their separate ways. And the premise at the beginning is to try to figure out who killed their biological father um, a year prior to this night. And it quickly, it, it changes over the course of the evening as they are talking. For, uh, for one, they, they start to realize that um, neither one of them actually did it. It was probably some kind of accident, something that will never ultimately be explained. And then they also come to a realization that there's certain shared memories or not shared memories that they have. And they begin to believe that they're actually not even brother and sister anymore. And there was a, a certain appeal whenever they came together in college and discovered that they were related. There was a certain appeal to that connection. But then as time went on and they both went to, you know, to see this biological father. And then, of course, he, he died and they um, kind of lived with that, you know, it, as the, the next year progressed. But it's it's written in a very Hitchcockian way. Uh, it just seemed to me as I was reading the book, that's what it felt like. So as they were drinking more, as he was smoking, as you know, they were realizing certain things about their past were coming into play. It just felt like a Hitchcock story. It was, it was a pretty good read. Um, I think the revelations about it, about the circumstance and about their connection, um, it, as it, as it rolled out, it was, it wasn't done quick or, you know, jauntingly or anything like that. It was just, it was just a kind of neat Hitchcockian sort of story. And then I also, of course, already had a re review up for Cormac McCarthy's Stella Maris. Um, this is, all it is is dialogue. There, there's no uh, description of the room around them. There's no description of, you know, the weather, what each other is wearing. Uh, but it, all it is is the exchange between Alicia Western and her doctor, um, Dr. Cohen, while she's at Still Amaris the, the week before she ends up committing suicide. And I'll, I'll put a link to my review of the book. I thought that it was really good. Um, I thought that, the, I mean, the dialogue by Cormac McCarthy is just phenomenal anyway. And a lot of the things that they discuss are really interesting. And I think that how they um, play against each other is also well done. I think that some of the things that she talks about, obviously, they're, you know, because a lot of math is a little over my head. But that being said, the way that she says it and the way that she kind of is coming to this sort of nihilistic view of the world. Um, one of my favorite lines in the book, actually, I saw it repeated in a review. Let's see if I can find it. I had it marked before, but. Um, so Dr. Cohen asks, if you had to say something definitive about the world in a single sentence, what would that sentence be? And Alicia answers, it would be this. The world has created no living thing that it does not intend to destroy. Pretty nihilistic. But at the same time, it's talking about we all end up in the same place in the end. And then I, I actually had started this uh, before Stella Maris came out. But I wanted, or I, I returned to it once I finished reading Stella Maris. A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. This is the first in the Monk and Robot books. Um, and the first, you know, the only one that I've read so far. But this is about Dex, who is a monk. At the beginning of the book, he has changed his vocation to become a tea monk. And after working that for uh, a couple of years to to get very good at it, he becomes disenchanted again and decides to go off into the wild to some hermitage that he knows of and to travel a road that he hasn't traveled. 
And in the course of that, he comes across Moscap, who is the robot. Now, many years ago, all the robots were allowed to basically leave human civilization, go out into the wild and live their own lives because they had found, um, or they had become sentient, they had become self-aware. And so they were released from working for humans and they went off and no longer did the humans or the robots interact. But every so often, um, a robot representative would come back to the human civilization and you know see if they needed anything. Well, Dex comes across Moscap. Moscap has volunteered to be that representative. And so it follows Moscap um, helping Dex basically get to this hermitage. And it's done as a parable. It's very much about how Dex is trying to find purpose in his life. And once, you know, once he is able to do what he wants to do, then he loses the desire to that do that. And he doesn't understand within himself why, you know, he has people who love him. He is successful at what he does. He has people, you know, who appreciate what he does, but he doesn't, he doesn't feel fulfilled in that pursuit. And so as he gets to um, this place, it's that once, you know, one extra step. And once he gets there, he's not fulfilled. And he just doesn't understand what is going on with him. And Moscap, you know, expresses to him that it's okay not to have purpose. Is that it's it's really about the journey. It's not about the destination. And he has examples of, of that with some of his um, robot friends and everything who like to watch, you know, different things happen around them and not actually be a part of it, just to be observant of it. And so... It, it's done really well as a parable because it, it is sort of this sort of, I don't know if I'm using the term correctly, but sort of a Zen sort of thing just to let things be and be in the moment rather than feeling like you have to have accomplished. And just the act of doing is, is its own reward in a lot of ways. And then towards the end of the book, um, after all of this, Dex had previously not agreed to help Moscap go to the different parts of Panja and talk to people. But at the end, he does because he knows where, you know, everything is and he will be a, a great benefit. And so rather than having, you know, his next thing, he's going to go along with Moscap and help him in his endeavor. So there's a certain amount of fulfillment within that. So those were the three books that I, I read this past week. And I just thought it was interesting that they all dealt with really this one-on-one -on -one interaction between uh, main characters. And even though each of them, of course, you know, talk about other characters that are off-site and um, the, you know, the Wild Built it did have a lot of decks interacting with other people at the beginning. The story was really about him meeting Moscap and how those or that interaction um, influenced, you know, their way forward. Uh, they were each, you know, this one is sort of a mystery book. This one is a bit of a parable. Um, I don't know what you would classify this as. It's really just, it's just dialogue uh, between Alicia and their therapist. So it, they were very different, but I just thought that it was neat how each of these authors put together those interactions with their characters. So if you have any other books that have that, you know, one-on-one -on -one trope that you found particularly interesting or, you know, uh, that delved into good ideas, then, you know, put them down in the comments below and let me know what, what you think. And until next time, have a good day. Bye.